the Haudenosaunee creation story. This is part one of a series of uh, webinars on cultural fluency. My name is Rick Hill. I work at Dayoha Hage at Six Nations Polytechnic in Ashwigan, Ontario. So what is the meaning of our creation story? What uh, relevance can we derive from that story today? What are the cultural lessons that our creation story has for us? What are our responsibilities as human beings as defined by this story? And how is the cultural intention of our creation expressed to us? Our creation story is a long, involved story. There's many different versions of it, uh, many different ways of looking on it. But basically, the idea is that uh, life on this world uh, came from above. There was a sky world in which uh, beings, much like us, lived in longhouses. They came down through a hole in that sky, and a whole era of perpetual regeneration was started. This painting by Arnold Jacobs uh, summarizes what the creation story is about. We're going to take a look at all of these elements. So above in the sky world were longhouses, and there was a tree in that world that gave off bright light, but the tree was starting to dim, starting to die. We see here the images of our, the moon, and the grandmother moon becomes a critical player in our story. We see the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash, along with strawberries and tobacco that were the gifts of creation to our ancestors. We see two twin boys, a good-minded boy who made good things and his brother who uh, made things that weren't so good. And we also see an image of the clans, of the families. These are just the elements of our creation story we'll take a look at. We have to understand that the Haudenosaunee universe is like a sphere. There's a world above uh, called the sky world, but there's also this sky dome that uh, holds uh, the celestial uh, bodies that we see. There's a big ocean in the middle, and number four in this slide here. And then below it is a dark world, a water world. These all elements come into play in defining us. Number one shows this light world that we're in, daylight, the good times, the time of the creator. Number two shows the dark world, when the sunlight disappears and darkness takes over, and his brother Flint begins to rule the world. So this shows a graphic depiction based upon a painting by Ernie Smith, who was a Seneca from Tonawanda, of that sky world in which these beings lived there. There was this old chief who was guarding that tree. We can see it's been uprooted, creating this hole in the sky world, a light falling down. There's a woman called the sky world who fell through that hole, was eventually uh, saved by a flock of geese placed on the back of a turtle. They say the muskrat and the beaver tried to dive down into the water to get uh, the earth uh, which the world was made out of. But we'll take a look at all of these things. But this gives us an idea of the sequence. Most of the stories have been depicted through our paintings and artwork. And there's a few recorded versions that go back to the early 19th century. So up in the sky world, this tree of light, they said the flowers gave off light. This old man was guarding it, but he had kind of a consternation. There was something bothering him. He had a deep-seated dream wish that the tree needed to be uprooted in order for life to proceed. In another village was a young woman who was suffering her grief for the loss of a loved one. She couldn't stop crying. Somehow they arranged that this young girl needed to meet this old man. She brought some cornbread with her to give to him to help ease his uh, mind, and then he in turn gave her some venison to help uh, uplift her mind. They say this was a marriage in the sky world between a male and female, but the idea is that she became pregnant and eventually she fell through that hole into the world below. She was caught by the birds as they put their big wings together and they placed it on the back of the turtle and this carving by Stan Hill. So we see here also the symbols then of this. You can see the sky dome and the little curly cue on top uh, that represents that tree up in the sky world. We can see the blue uh, line representing the water world and all the cross uh, hatching representing the world underneath there. And on top of that is either a little mound with three plants growing or the little green with the red uh, represents life on the back of the turtle because this is where the original sky woman was placed. So the world above is very fascinating to us. Maybe all cultures look skyward when they want to figure out what's the meaning of life. But up there then, this celestial tree of life that gave off a, a beautiful light. We also see symbols of the sun in a silver brooch and that of the stars. The stars are very important to us. We're told that there are ancestors up there in the sky world. And then the phases of the moon help us because it does provide some light at night. So this, this lightness of daylight is offset by the darkness because of the stars and the moon. In one version of the creation story, there's a sky panther that races through the sky. He's like a comet. And they said that he was the one that probably started this thing happening. He, he created consternation in the mind of the old man that maybe the, the baby that the sky woman was carrying wasn't his. So some people believed he cast her out of the sky world. I prefer to believe that they sat there and they made an agreement that her destiny was to fall into this world below and start an era of constant regeneration. 
Anyway, the sky panther is depicted in these various versions. We see here a clay pipe, I mean a wooden pipe. We see an uh, antler carving. And you can imagine this panther racing across the sky so fast he appears to be a light. Later in the story, we find that the comet becomes the symbol, though, of impending danger because this panther caused some consternation in the original creation story. So the celestial tree of lights up there in the sky world, I kind of believe it's modeled after a sunflower, as we can see here, with many flowers on it. This design is beaded on nearly every skirt that the Haudenosaunee women wear. And you imagine then a whole circle of women dancing around, you see this beautiful designs in there, each one recalling our origins in the creation story. They say around that tree up there in the sky world grew this little plant called a yellow dog-toothed lily or a yellow violet. Somehow when the sky woman was falling, she grasped at the edge of the hole and some people believed then some of the seeds of life were caught into her hands, possibly this plant here. What's ironic about this plant is that it was used to prevent pregnancy. So was the old man guarding the tree of life that had this plant around there, hoping that that plant wouldn't come into this world, but it did, it followed the sky woman. And so we had two things going on here. The sky world light was diminishing, almost like it was dying. Death came to the world above. She had to start this process of perpetual regeneration and giving birth to protect life that was about to come into the new world. I think it was his hope that this plant didn't follow the sky woman. So the sky woman fell. It must have been quite a journey falling into this dark world. Imagine it was like a shaft of light coming down. But there was water animals down there before. There were birds, uh, turtles, fish, other animals that lived in the water. They looked up and they saw this woman coming. Into this water world she fell, and all of the animals that were already there, and the creation story doesn't explain where they came from and why they were there, but they held a council together. They were able to communicate with one another. They basically asked, what are we going to do about this, this creature we see falling from the sky? We have to help her. So they decided to send their big birds up there to break her fall. We imagine that there are the Canadian geese. They put their wings together, they caught her, and they slowly brought her down to the back of a turtle. This painting by Arnold Jacobs kind of depicts the, what the view from above might have looked like to the sky woman. You know, in prehistoric times, there were huge turtles, as we can see here, large enough to put, carry somebody on their back. At first, you know, the story sounds a little fanciful, but then I start thinking about it. It's possible. Now, these are sea turtles. The likelihood of my ancestors ever seeing them were pretty slim, but the fact is that there are, in the old days, turtles big enough to carry a woman on its back. So the turtle is known to carry a home on his back, this little mound-shaped thing, this uh, dome on his back. This is why we use the turtle to make a rattle when used in our ceremonies, because it represents the shaking of the earth, everything that comes in harmony with that beat, the heartbeat of uh, Mother Earth. The turtle shell is also our calendar. There's 13 main plates on the back. Talk about the 13 moons that happen usually in every year. And then there's a number of smaller plates that go around the outside that represent the number of days of the month between each new moon. So we could keep track of time. So the turtle is this uh, symbol of the earth, rests on its back, but it's also an important timekeeper to us. And as we know, turtle's been around ever since prehistoric times. We also know that underneath this land, there is another underworld. This is some photographs of a place called Howe's Caverns near Albany, New York. Some people say there's a whole network of caves that goes all the way across the territory of the Haudenosaunee from Albany to Niagara Falls, that deep, dark underworld. That's what our ancestors talked about. And the world below is occupied by very mysterious, uh, dangerous beasts. And this is a commonality to native cultures in the Northeast. We see here this uh, horned serpent among the Anishinaabek people. There was a drawing of this uh, feathered uh, serpent, long tail, long antlers, uh, that was near St. Louis. And one the early French Jesuits, as they were traveling around, they saw this depicted on the side of a, of a cliff. Or this other one here of this panther with uh, antlers comes from a Delaware image from uh, Lower State, New York. Anyway, this idea of the underworld and of this dark, dangerous place is common to our ancestors. So the sky woman fell placed on the back of the turtle, and they said then a little uh, a muskrat dove to the bottom of that world, came up with a little piece of clay, put it on the back of the turtle, and it kind of magically began to grow. Somehow this inspired the sky woman. She began to sing, began to dance. As she moved her feet on the back of this little uh, mound of uh, mud, it began to grow. And more and more she danced. She danced in a counterclockwise direction. The island grew bigger and bigger and bigger. As she was dancing, they said that she would turn from time to time. 
and she would cast the seeds that she brought from the sky world around, the different crops, the plants that she brought from above into this. So today, when we see a women's dance, you'll see them kind of mimic those actions. They're actually repeating and honoring what took place at the creation with the original sky woman. And this is one reason why we honor women in the Haudenosaunee society. It created a worldview among our people that women have a special connection to this land, to this earth. And these two paintings, they talk about the sky woman. Remember, she was pregnant when she fell from above, placed on the back of the turtle. She gave birth to a daughter. So the first being born in this new land was a woman. And that daughter grew very rapidly, and they said she became impregnated. Now, there's two different versions of the story. One is shown here, gets, she gets impregnated by the west wind. Or in another version of the story, she gets impregnated by this very handsome man who was actually a turtle spirit. He came and he laid two arrows over her bed. One had a flint point on it, and one didn't have any point. As a result of that, she became pregnant with these two twins. One, we say, is the good-minded twin, made with the arrow with no point, and his brother, whose body was covered with flint, symbolized by the flint on his arrow tip. So these creation twins both had the power to make things, but they also battled. They battled inside their mother's body. In fact, when they were born, uh, the good-minded twin was born in the natural way, but his brother decided to be born out from underneath his mother's arm, and in doing so, tore her body apart and caused her to bleed to death. So the good-minded one comes into the world to do good things. His brother comes into the world and actually killing his mother and seeks to destroy all of the good things that his good-minded brother was creating. I believe this is also the origin of this stylized haircut that our warriors had because they said when Flint was born, he had a crest of sharp flint on the top of his head, like this roach. Imagine it, uh, sharp arrowheads. And that's what cut through his mother's body. So I believe that when our old warriors wanted to go to battle and they shaved their head, they're recalling this moment uh, which Flint brought death to this world. Therefore, the image on the war clubs, the, the image of, that they paint themselves with this red symbolizing the blood that they're about to spill, becomes a common feature to warriors among the, the Northeast. So when they buried the body of the daughter, a strange thing happened. They say these plants grew from her body. So this is a drawing by Jesse Cornplanter, a Seneca from Tonawanda. We see the original Sky Woman now becoming a grandmother. We see one of her grandsons contemplating the death of his mother. Out of her head grows a tobacco plant. From her, her chest grows the corn. From her stomach grows beans, a squash. And then from her feet grow the potatoes. So these are the gifts of life that she's giving in the sacrifice of her body. So this is why we say the grandmother moon is connected to the females. The grandmother moon is actually derived from the body of the daughter that passed away. Her head was turned into the moon. And as the moon grows full each, each month, it mimics then that the, uh, the possibility that women could become pregnant. Actually, it was, there was a feeling at one time that all women became pregnant at the same time. But at any rate, this growing belly of the moon, and then it diminishes, represents this life cycle among the females. So it was the gifts of the daughter who passed away, this life-giving gifts that we call the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash, strawberry, which is our first medicine plant that we honor, and the tobacco plant that we use to offer thanksgiving to the powers to be. So in her passing, in her death, came this hope for renewal, this hope that life would continue. That's why something like the simplest corn may seem so common, but yet what a precious gift because it allows us to take this very hard kernel and process it and cook it to produce food that will sustain our lives. So this is why we actually call the three sisters uh, our sustainers, our life supporters, the things that makes us continue. This is the gift that the creation gave to us. But there's more gifts. Look at these purple potatoes. They say that these are the original wild potatoes that grew from her feet. You don't hardly see them anymore. Next to it is some heirloom potatoes. Potatoes are just as important to the indigenous people of the Americas as corn. And there are many vi wide varieties of corn that we were given. It's a great gift. We probably have 15 different kinds of corn. The one you see on the left has actually got a little husk around each kernel. It's considered a great medicine. You would plant one of those in your cornfield to help to renew that. A wide variety of beans were also given to us. We probably have 40 or 50 different kinds of beans that were used in the past and a wide variety of squashes, maybe a dozen or so different types. So you see this great blessing that the creation gave us. It's our original food plan, and it was provided for us 
This is a painting of the Three Sisters by Ernie Smith. We also believe there's a spiritual essence to the plants, like three sisters standing together, helping one another. We've learned since then that the beans uh, produce nitrogen that feeds the soil that the corn needs to grow. So they're kind of helping each other like sisters are supposed to. So this was also the way that we were taught that nature is, that it responds, it has an intelligence, has a spirit, and that we need to come in harmony with that. So this great contest began between the creator and his brother Flint. They played all kinds of games. They wrestled with one another. They ran races. Uh, they played lacrosse. And this, this scene depicted by John Fadden shows the good-minded creator about to strike his brother with a deer antler and bring uh, his uh, attempt to rule the world uh, to an end. And when he did that, he struck his brother, kind of knocked some sense into him. In some of the stories, they say he actually killed him, but he, he disempowered him. And what happens then is they make an agreement and the creator says, well, my brother, since I love you, you're still going to be part of this creation, but you're no longer going to try to destroy what I'm doing. The creator then went about and started making things that were going to be beneficial to the humans that he was also going to make. They say these are the first three things that he made. A yellow sunflower, which was the first food plant. Red willow, which was the first medicine plant. And the bluebird, which was the first feathered bird to help beautify the skies. He was creating all of this stuff, all of these plants and animals and things that we would need in order to be beneficial for us, things that would provide us food as compared to those animals that we don't eat their flesh, but we use their furs to keep warm during the winter. All of this was provided for us. There was a great intelligence to the plan that was made. However, Flint was also creating things before he was pacified. He made everything that was icky and stinky and poisonous and dangerous and ugly. All of this stuff to undermine the beauty of creation. They say that uh, as the creator made things, his brother tried to mimic it. So when the creator made the blue bird, Flint tries to make a bird, but he just doesn't quite have the same power and his bird comes out looking like the bat in the middle. They say when the creator finally made some humans, his brother still tried to make some humans, but instead they turned into a monkey. So he began to make things to undermine the great peacefulness and security that the creator brother was making. So Flint's job was to pervert nature. He created hail to knock down the new plants. He created ice to kill everything in this world. He created some mysterious animals like this the blue lizard. All of these things that make it very difficult so there's a beautiful medicine plant. You go to pick it, it has thorns. There's, everything is to just cause some turmoil to humans. The creator couldn't change all of this because his brother did have some creative powers. But what they decided was that Flint was going to go live underground. He's going to take all those creepy crawly things uh, with him. So maybe this is why then we have this idea that these horned serpents are underground. There actually is a rattlesnake that has these horns. We can see in the top thing. It's not so much common to our country. But this idea of lizards snakes with the horns, uh, panthers with the long tail and horns. And you look at the design, they represent the waves of the water. When things are calm, they're at rest. When they act up and whip their tail, then the waters kick up. And if you're in a canoe on a rough weather, you realize that your fate could be you'd end up down there as lunch for these serpents. But in all things of our creation story, you know, there's some good things and there's some bad things. There's some there are serpents that are helpful to us as well. Sometimes it's hard to know the difference between the two. All that means is that humans were born into this great drama of trying to exist in this world that has some very beneficial things, some dangerous things. This talks a little bit about the origin of the Seneca Nations where this huge serpent circled this hill. There were only two people left and eventually they, they figured out how to kill the serpent. He rolled down the hill and died and that place is called Bald Hill. It's near Canandaigua, New York. Around the bottom of that hill you'll see these round stones. They say were all of the skulls of the people that this serpent had uh, digested. The creator also made the four winds from the four different directions, and he put in charge of this, uh, this wind keeper. And the west wind is like a panther racing across the sky. The north wind is like a grizzly bear bringing the icy cold winds. The east wind is like a moose who dips his head in the water and shakes it off and sends a cool rain. And then the warm, gentle winds of summer are like a fawn walking around uh, or a doe looking to have its baby somewhere restful. So these four animals symbolize that. When this keeper of the winds holds them all together, there is no wind for that day, as depicted in his painting by Orrin Lyons. The creator also made a rainbow, took those colors from the, those original colors, from the bluebird, the red willow, and the yellow sunflower, 
And he did this to remind us when we see the rainbow that our life here is connected to up in the sky world. There's this path that goes that way. But he also said that when a rainbow appears, particularly when it goes from ground to ground and looks like a bow, that's a call to the thunder beings who exist behind the dark clouds. They'll race and they'll grab that bow, and their job is to chase those horned serpents back into the water to keep that underwater panther under there. So when we would see a rainbow, it's kind of a symbol of um, tragic or dramatic times. You have to be very careful because danger lurks on the horizon. This creates a universal struggle then between the sky world beings, like the thunder beings who shoot their, their arrows of lightning at these serpents, trying to keep them under the water. So when we hear thunder rolling, we always give thanks because they're, they're there to try to protect us, to try to cleanse the air, cleanse the water, and keep a disease and pestilence uh, underground where it belongs. As I mentioned, then the Creator had to defeat his brother and use his deer on her to strike them and that uh, knocked some sense into him, but that's when they made the, their arrangement that they'll separate into the two realms. So the deer antler becomes a very important symbol to us. We see it later in that when we made the chiefs in our communities, we put deer antlers on their headdress to symbolize their authority. So there's great power in these deer antlers. And just like the deer, the male deer, uh, moose, and uh, elk, <clears throat> they shed their antlers every year. And so we believe in that, that shedding of their antlers symbolizing what took place at the time of the creation. And yet they're renewed by it. And their antler grows stronger, grows bigger every year. So the antlers on a chief's headdress symbolizes not only their authority, but their ability to look after the creation. Just as the creator defeated his brother, he also had to defeat the sky woman because for some reason she sided with Flint. She worked very hard to undermine uh, the work of the creator. So they ended up playing this great bowl game. And it really was a great uh, gamble for the future of the world. They use these little counters that are dark on one side and light on the other, just like a chickadee's head. They put them in the bowl and they shake the bowl. And what they're playing for is to who's going to win uh, those little beans on the lower right, the seed, literally the seeds of life. Well, the creator, since he made the chickadee, made the dice, he actually used chickadees' heads, in his, when he shook the bowl, they all flew up, and of course they all came up the way that he wanted, and he was able to, to beat his uh, grandmother at this game. And losing the game, she decided, I now understand what you're trying to do. I understand the goodness of what you're doing, so I'm going to try to help you. So she shifted her focus, and she became an, an instrumental part in making the world safe for humans. To this very day, we still play this game that some call the Great Sacred Gamble. And in that, we also bet four things, a turtle rattle, a lacrosse stick, our traditional clothing, or a string of white wampum. Those are the things that we offer. You don't really lose the game, if, uh, even if the other side wins all of the beans. But it's this idea that we're reenacting this story from the time of creation. And whoever wins the game then uh, wins certain ceremonial uh, obligations for the coming season. So it's a way of balancing that in our community. And you'll see this game played at several of our ceremonial celebration and Thanksgiving. The Creator also made nature as if it was one big dish. And he gave us one spoon from which we would all share from that dish. The idea is that we all have an equal right to what's in the dish, all the plants, the animals, the fish, all of the medicines, all of that good stuff. And that we would take this spoon and we'd all take our share you always leave something in the dish for everybody else. So these depictions of the dish, we can see the one wampum design, which is very uh, important, the dish with one spoon. We can also see in the lower left a bark trade that was made by Joseph Brandt when he brought people here to Grand River. So the tray divided into five sections, and in the middle are little depictions of a beaver tail, because the beaver tail was considered the most nutritious meal that we were supposed to share. After all of this was done, the Creator said it was safe for him to make humans. He took some clay, he molded a figure, he put in some of his flesh, some of his blood, some of his mind. He breathed into this figure and it came alive. And this is the original human beings, what we call the Ongwe Ongwe, original sacred beings. <clears throat> These are different depictions of humans uh, from uh, ancient uh, art of our ancestors. But at the same time, he gave us some instructions about how to live here in the world. He said, I've made this world for you, but you need to know how to live in it well. So we call these original instructions uh, the foundation of our life. It's the thing that guides us in our connection to nature, to uh, each other, to the celestial beings, to the unseen forces of this universe. 
And you can see these depicted in a variety of ways. So look at this uh, cradleboard design. It's a Mohawk cradleboard. You can see the sky dome and these three things. Is that the three sisters? This flowering tree up above. It all represents this life will continue. Then there was this ancient carving found in the field uh, near where the Tuscarora Nation resides today in Lewiston, New York. So it looks to me like on the back of this bear is this woman with a baby on her back. The so connection to the animals is very important. Through clans, we all become intimately connected with a different aspect of nature. And we have animal clans, uh, bird clans, uh, reptile clans, uh, it's other, and fish clans. It's very important to our people to find a way in which we can be connected to the forces of nature. But also when we look up into the sky at night and we see these stars, what they tell us, the stars then, are the spiritual essence of our ancestors. They return to the sky world where they came from and then they sparkle. They gather around the campfires of our other relatives. They say the Milky Way is this great pathway of the footprints of all of our ancestors who traveled there. So the whole idea is that the Earth is our mother, the Moon is our grandmother, the Sun is our elder brother, the winds are our grandfathers, and these crops are our three sisters. That's one huge extended family, that you're never alone. Eventually, part of our spirit will return on that path to the sky world. But we have a lot of great stories about the stars. We've lost a lot of knowledge about them, but we still have a few. One, we talk about these seven brothers who were dancing. They danced so hard and so well. They loved dancing so much, they began to rise up into the sky. And they're still today visible. You can see them dancing there. We call it the Pleiades. The other is the story about uh, hunters who are chasing this wounded bear. They keep chasing him every year. When he arrives up above us in the fall time, his blood drips down on the trees and changes the leaves from green to red and orange and yellow. That's manifested in the sky by the Big Dipper. So when we see these stars move and in certain places, that tells us when we're supposed to have our ceremonies. So now you should be able to provide some interpretation of this painting I did of the creation. We can see the sky world and you see that little uh, indication of the tree of life. We see the grandmother moon, the elder brother sun. We see the sky woman who fell there. She brought down uh, eventually these uh, twins. And then we see the North America on the back of the turtle. So these are the teachings of creation. To summarize this great long story, this great uh, tradition, that we are told to be thankful. Everything that we need has been provided for us in the creation. All that we need to be happy and healthy is there. And all we need to do is be thankful for it. So this is why our ceremonies are so important. We were told that we should also love one another, that all humans uh, are the same. And we are all connected to one another, even though we have different clans and different nations, that we're all sacred beings. And so we should care for one another, have such great love for one another as to not bring any harm to each other. And then the third thing is, is that we should be mindful, though, that our words, our thoughts, and our actions have power. So you have to have a good mind, they said. You have to be thinking about good things in order to live well in this world. So this is why whenever we gather, you'll hear a long Thanksgiving address. And we're thankful for many things in the creation, but we often start after we thank the people. We acknowledge that our mother, the earth, still continues to do the job that she set out to do. She supports our feet as we walk around. She provides all this bounty. She provides this great nurturing. In this uh, painting by Carson Waterman, a Seneca from Allegheny, we can see then that life was meant to continue here in the world. So our creation story is a long involved uh, process by which we've gained uh, our position here in the world, our responsibility in the world. But it also hangs in jeopardy. If humans don't do what we're supposed to do, this could all come to an end. So this is why it's important to take a look at the creation story, not only to think about what it was like a long, long, long time ago, but think what it could be like a long, long, long time from today. We have to be forward thinking and to think about all of those babies that are born out of the earth for their future. So this is why it's important to take a look at the creation story, and I appreciate you taking the time with me today.